Amen. Okay. Can you hear me? We on? Okay, it's good. I'm going to jump straight in with the passage today. So we're in James chapter 3, verse 1. So I'm going to read that first for a change. Normally I'll do a bit of introduction, but we're just going to get straight into it. It says, in verse 1, and I'm reading from the, hopefully, the English Standard Version. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with stricter, with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot directs, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set amongst our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. But with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce frig, figs? Frigs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. I'm going to come back and, and read those last five verses later on. The tongue, it says, is a fire in this passage. That's my title for this morning. The tongue is a fire. It's a world of unrighteousness. But then the contrast we see is it is also used for praising God and for encouraging others, both which is good and righteous. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. When God created the world, it said he spoke and things came into being. So the, the voice is strong. So this passage that we've read here, and I'm going to pray in a moment, but the passage here today is about the tongue and particularly the words we say, how we say them and how we can tame our tongues because the tongue is a powerful force. Your words are powerful. We have that, that familiar phrase that we would hear in, in, in school playgrounds, sticks and stones will break my bones but names will never hurt me. It is the biggest untruth. Because actually names and words can hurt more than sticks and stones. And we are shaped in our lives by sometimes the words that people have said over us or said to us. So the tongue is a powerful thing. So how do we know if we're using it for good or for evil? Because the tongue alone doesn't operate on its own, does it? As we were saying a few weeks ago, it isn't some sort of restless beast in our mouth that does what it likes. So we'll see what that says. But it also, it's not just about what we say in speech. It's also about what we write. It's how we communicate in all ways. You know, even those who use sign language, 
that, I think this speaks into that as well. It's how you communicate with other people. This is what it's talking about. With just your, with a pen, with a keyboard, with your hands. Um, famous phrase, the pen, says Edward, Bul I think it's Bulwer Lytton, says the pen is mightier than the sword. Words have power to change people's lives. Earlier in this letter, James says, be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. Quick to respond to God. It's our application of how we can control our tongues. Be slow to speak. Wait. Think about it. When the Bible talks about the tongue, it, it means about what you say. But it's also how you say it and who you're saying it to. And we need to have faith in Jesus to be able to help us control this tongue. So we're going to look at a few things. We're going to look at the tongue, the powerfulness of the tongue, the bringing both blessing and cursing. We're going to look at the tongue being a measure of our maturity as Christians. And then secondly, how we use our, and thirdly, how we use our tongue. Okay, let me pray and then uh, I'll continue. Lord Jesus, I pray you help me to speak well this morning, to encourage and strengthen to use your word wisely. By the Holy Spirit, would you fill me so that my words are from you, O oh God. Lord, we long for more of you in our lives, impacting us in everything we do and everything we say. Lord, I thank you that the opportunity I have to speak this morning is an opportunity to see someone's life change. And Lord, we want to see that change for good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the power of the tongue. The first thing we see in this passage, which I'm honest with you, it's, it's, it's sat heavy with me all week. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So as you're preparing a message on a passage that starts with that, if you're not filled with some sort of fear that you may stumble, then the passage goes on to say, you're the perfect man. Now I know I'm not a perfect man. I take it, and, and the, the encouragement here is we need to take responsibility. We shouldn't teach idly. We need to teach responsibly. When we're speaking from the Bible, when we're speaking for God, we need to be clear that it's from God. If it's your opinion, then you need to make that clear. This is my opinion. I stumble with my words a lot. You only have to ask my children don't always get it right. I talk a lot. My, my mum, is not here to justify this comment, I didn't speak as a child until I was two. So they thought there was something wrong with me. I had an older brother and sister and they said, the doctor said, no, they're doing all the talking for him. There's nothing wrong with his voice just hasn't decided to use it yet. And what my mum used to say, that my first words, and I said it to my, one of my aunts, Auntie Ira, and I said, I can see my flexion. They were my first words. My mum says, I've not stopped talking since. <laughs> but I can stumble over my words and say the wrong thing to, the, to someone. I can say... And on truth, 
I can speak in an unloving way to people, I can be critical. The tongue is difficult to tame. I can go off on a tangent. My wife dry, says, you, you went off again on a tangent this morning. So I'm speaking and I'll, I thought and I'll go over here with a little tangent and I've wasted five minutes. Now, if that tangent is from the Holy Spirit, hopefully it speaks to someone. And I, that's why I say, well, it was the Holy Spirit. It may not have been in my notes. But I'm hoping those things are good. I like preaching through a book like we're doing today. I like speaking through a book because it, it builds on the teaching rather than just picking things out here, there and everywhere. You, you consistently can see the message that James is bringing as we read through James. He repeats certain things. He builds upon the truth. For we all stumble in many ways. We can all say something that is, we can say it's biblical. But we can have different understandings of what is biblical and what that is. And reading the Bible, if you're reading in English, you're reading someone's interpretation. Because it wasn't written in English. That might be news to some. It was written in Hebrew and Greek. Now, unless you're able to study in those languages, you're looking at someone else's interpretation. If you, and if you read if you, the different interpretations, it's great that God can use those. But you're going to see the, the differences and the emphasis that certain Bibles put on different passages. Churches have split. Movements have grown up because of a disagreement on a certain passage. No church, let me say this, this is my opinion. No church and no person has a monopoly on the truth other than Jesus. Now you might agree with that, you might not. But no one, I think, has a monopoly on the truth. No one can say, I know this is biblical and what you're saying is wrong. So, What's the application here? Be careful if you're a teacher. Take it responsible. Even if you're, if you're teaching children, if you're teaching adults, if it's a small or large group, if you're writing blogs, if you're putting comments on Facebook or wherever it is, be careful what you write. You're teaching, you're teaching someone else. Someone else is reading that and reading it as gospel. Be careful when you teach. We want to be building people up when we're teaching. I've skipped a page. When we're teaching, we need to be doing it in a loving way. Building people up. It says in 1 Corinthians 8, and he's talking about food offered to idols here, but the, the, the principle is the same. It says, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, it says, but love builds up. It's no good having knowledge. We need to have love as well. We need to be careful how we speak, that we speak with love. We have enough in the Bible to help us, don't we? To agree. There's more that unites us than separates us. This is how Jesus summed up the law and the prophets when he was asked. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. It's in Luke 10 verse 27 and in Matthew 22 and in Mark 12. It's repeated three times what Jesus said. And what he says in Matthew says, on these two commandments hand all the law and prophets. So if you want to speak well, if you want to keep your tongue under control, firstly, you give your life to God and you honor him with all that you have, your whole being. The only word that it doesn't say is, it, you know, it says soul, mind, strength. It could say tongue in there as well, couldn't it? 
Honor God with your tongue and love your neighbor as yourself. So we need to put God first in our lives and then other people. Are you loving other people in the words that you say? And what is the judgment that will be on those who are teaching or with the words that we're using? It says in, Jesus says, everyone to whom much was given of him much will be required and from him to from him to whom they entrusted much they will demand the more so there's a, a sense that when you've been given something a judgment is what have you done with what God's given you what if you've got a gift that God has given you what are you doing with that gift you've been entrusted with a gift we think about the parable of the talents don't hide your gift in the ground Use the gift. Use it well. Use it lovingly. This tongue, it says, and we get these three illustrations, don't we? The tongue is this small member of our, our body, but it can steer the whole body, it says. The whole course of your life. You know, we see, we talked about that a few weeks ago. That the bit in the horse's mouth can steer the horse. It's a tiny thing in its mouth. The rudder on a ship that can steer the ship against strong winds where the pilot wishes it to go. The impact of this small member of our body is huge. And we, the, the, this last one was about a small fire that can set a forest ablaze. The impact is huge on how we use it. But the tongue is key to the measure of our maturity. How do we tame our tongues? Well, if we look at James later in James, he says two things about our speech. It says in James 5, verse, I think it's verse 9 or verse, I think it's 9. Don't grumble against others so you won't be judged. And secondly, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So these two things, don't grumble about others. Speak lovingly about others and then he says let your yes be yes don't make oaths don't swear on different things you know you swear on the bible oh, is your if you're a christian you're always under oath to speak the truth so we can see that our, our tongues can be used negatively we can use them in an unloving way we can use them in an untruthful way but the bible's telling us don't do this is what it says in ephesians 4 it says in verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love if we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from the whole body. Rather speaking the truth in love. It's a whole passage about maturity in the church. That these, we have the Ephesian four leadership gifts come the apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the pastor, the evangelist. We have those and then they're here to equip the saints for building up the body, for building up unity, for growing in maturity. So we need to use our tongues for speaking the truth in love. Our speech will reflect the maturity that's within us. The depth of our relationship with God will be reflected on how we speak to other people. Our understanding of what God has called us to do will be reflected in how you speak to other people and how you understand that. The verses here seem to suggest if you control your tongue, you can control your whole body. But when our heart relationship with God controls our speech doesn't it? this is what Jesus says in Matthew 12 34 for out of the overflow of your of the heart the mouth speaks so you speak what's in your heart so be careful what's coming out as that's what's in your heart it's easy isn't it I, you know, I can say something unkind to my wife and I can apologize and say I'm sorry I didn't mean it but it's too late it's out I think Tim, Timothy Kelly uses the thing. We can, 
you know, if you, you can stab someone with a sword and you can apologize afterwards, but the wound is still there. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. So we need to speak out of our maturity and our relationship with Christ. We need to be building one another up. Lying is not helpful. Neither is gossiping or slandering someone. And it's actually you know, just saying someone's in the wrong. Speaking out of our relationship is really unhelpful. As a local body... We need to speak, speak the truth to one another in love. It may be, we, we might have something that we need to say to someone that's true. But if you say it in an unloving, uncaring way, the truth is not necessarily going to be honoured by that, is it? Truth has to be both true and loving. If it doesn't build up, you know when we look at, at the verses in Matthew 18... And, and Jesus talks about how you, if someone sinned against you, go to your brother and try and win him over. It doesn't, you know, punt out your fault, trying to win, you're trying to win him. You're trying to win her. You're not just trying to point out what you've done wrong to me. That might be the truth, but if, if it's not a love, you're not going to win them over. You're not going to reconcile that relationship. You're just going to cause more pain. And you might have something that you think someone needs to know. But you have to think about the timing of when you tell those things to people. Because if you say it, if you don't think about it, you'll say it at a time that's not appropriate, that's not helpful. It won't be necessarily received well. And it, it goes against the truth. We go back to that Ephesians 4. Speak the truth with love. Tim Keller says, and when he was speaking about ourselves, I was uh, listening to him uh, yesterday, and he says, when you're defending yourself, so these are two ways that we, we use our, our tongue. When you're defending yourself, you won't be completely truthful. Well, that's tough, isn't it? When you're defending yourself, so when you're trying to defend yourself from someone else, you won't be completely truthful. But when you're talking about someone else, you won't be completely loving. We have to keep a balance of these things. Being truthful and loving, the both things need to come together. We need to watch that. We need to be aware of those things in our lives. We need wisdom, and we'll come on to that in a minute. So how are you using your tongue? I just want to get into this thing that, that the tongue is a fire, it says. A restless evil and difficult to control. We use fire, don't we? Perhaps more so in the past for, for good and, and for bad. We use, we use it for heat, and we use, it, we use it for cooking, and we still do to some degree. Is that, is that okay as a, as a thing? We... But uncontrolled fire can cause immense damage. But it, it also creates good. Yes? Is that, is that okay as an analogy? It creates good. We can, we can heat us, keeps us alive. We can feed ourselves because we prepare food and it keeps us, again, keeps us alive. So in a controlled state, it, but it's still dangerous. Yes? It's still dangerous even when we're using it for heating and cooking. There's still a danger in using those things. So we have to have careful boundaries. Fire destroys everything that you put in it, pretty much. Except that there's a test of fire, and our works will stand in that fire. If it's made of metal, it'd be damaged, though, wouldn't it? So we should be we shouldn't be careless with our words, because it's a fire. They can, it can destroy. But it reflects what's going on inside us. The tongue, it says, is used for both praising God and cursing men who are made in his image. So we're praising God one minute and then we're cursing men who are made in God's image the next minute. Which, what James is saying, that doesn't make sense. Why would you say, I'm honouring God, I love God. 
And even though, you know, Rick's made in the image of God. Oh, that Rick. Can't believe it. He did this morning. But Rick is made in the image of God. So we're just cursing God. Not honouring God by putting Rick down. We can be praising one minute and you know and cursing. And we, 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 you know, we can do it at the same time. It should not be happening, says James. In John, 1 John 4, it says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. We can't declare our love for God and then hate our brother or sister. It reflects, the tongue reflects what's going on in your heart, what's going on in here, your level of maturity and your level of relationship with God. And according to this passage, none of us have got that perfect. We are reliant on trusting God to do that. There's an interesting, um, it seems like a hopeless case, doesn't it? And I, we're going to leave it there for this morning. No, I'm joking. Um, we did start late. I'm going to continue. It seems hopeless, doesn't it? It seems like, well, how am I ever going to get a grip of this thing? Well, there are some ways. Firstly, speaking the truth in love. Secondly, if we think about Acts 2 and the day of Pentecost, in verse 3 and 4, it says, a different fire comes at that point. It says that the Holy Spirit fell on them and it was as if tongues of fire came down upon them and touched each person. It kindled new powers. And they spoke in other tongues. Tongues, it says in verse 11, that declared the mighty works of God. So our tongues and our speech can be restored, can be renewed, can be good and righteous by allowing the Holy Spirit to come upon us, to allowing him to speak through us, to being in close relationship with the Holy Spirit, allowing the Spirit to move in your life. Being aware that actually I need you, God. Yes, we have responsibility with what comes out of our mouths. When you speak in tongues, and so we're not going to go into depth in that, actually, the, the Bible says your spirit is speaking to God, but your mind doesn't know what you're saying. Actually, when you speak in tongues, you're praising God, you're able to honor God because that's what's coming out of your heart. It speaks what's coming out of your heart, what's coming out of your spirit. If you want to build yourself up, the Bible says, speak in tongues. It builds you up. The final part of these verses says you can't get fresh water from a salt spring. The point here is that the bitterness of the salt water will pollute the fresh always. It's tough, isn't it? Whereas light, it's great, the, the, the illustration with light is much better, whereas light, darkness can't dispel light. But here, salt water can damage your fresh water. It pollutes the fresh. We see that down rivers, fresh rivers, there'll be what we call brackish water. It's affected by the salt from coming in from the sea. And you think, well, I thought the water was flowing the other way. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a change, isn't there? And the estuaries are full of salt, salted water. If we're being filled with the Holy Spirit, our speech will be better. 
we'll be able to encourage, because actually God encourages us so we can encourage other people. If you're reading your Bible, you'll be able to, and with the Holy Spirit's help, you'll be able to encourage other people. This is what Proverbs 16, 24 says. And this is a great verse. It says, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. It's the power of the tongue that you can use gracious words that will be sweet, like sweet, fresh water. And there'll be healing for people. We need this fundamental change in our lives, trusting God more. So if you're not a Christian this morning and you want to change your speech, you need to believe in him. You need to give your life to him. And then your speech will be able to change. Because you'll never be able to tame it on your own. You'll only be able to tame it with God's help. Our speech can damage all our relationships. How many people here have had relationships damaged because of what has been said in those? Close, not close. They're damaged by speech because it comes out of the heart. We need, and I'm going to conclude with this, wisdom from God. And I want to read those last few verses because I think they're helpful to see. What would be good speech? What someone who is filled with the Spirit will be bringing? It says in verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. So here's the verse, verse 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. They're the sort of speech that we want, isn't it? That's wisdom from above. That's God speaking through us. And it says, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. These are the sort of things that God wants us to speak. Don't be looking at jealousy, bitterness, selfish ambition. Don't allow those things to dwell in your hearts. Allow wisdom from above to make you peaceful, loving, gentle, open to reason. You're full of God. So in conclusion, the tongue is a powerful force for both good and bad. So make sure you control what you say and how you say it. Allow the Holy Spirit to season your speaking. It is a fire that can bring disorder and death, but it's also a fire that can bring life and healing. We need to keep getting the fresh water, wisdom from above, that God can keep us fresh in relationship with him and honoring him in all our relationships. Amen.